Okay, let's hope that everybody is feeling really so far relaxed and enjoying. And um, as I poured my glass of water um, from a plastic bottle, I had a message saying no plastic bottles. Okay, so the next time I've got to make the time and, um, and Bev, I'm, I'm personally uh, publicly apologizing, but um, we do recycle, but my Bev Ginsburg, that's for you. Okay, and I do do my recycling. So we're, um, we're all in it together. So here we go. Baruch Atah Adonai Lehenu Melech HaOlam Shakol Nebed Baruch. Okay, so <clears throat> welcome back. Everybody with me? Okay, everybody can hear, we're all okay. So our next guest, um, guest speaker um, that I'd like to introduce everybody to is Rebetzin Tsipora Gottlieb, um, who became Rebetzin Tsipora Gottlieb on Tuesday um, on Lagba Omer. And I'd like to personally take the opportunity now to um, wish Rebetzin Gottlieb and Rabbi David Gottlieb a huge, huge mazel tov. And on Lagba Omer, the, the yacht site, the anniversary of the death of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who brought the Kabbalistic world of the Zohar to our beautiful nation, um, all those thousands of years ago, is certainly something that um, both um, Rebetzin Sipora and Rabbi David um, hold very close. But not only do they learn, they internalize every little bit of Torah that they learn. And what is so beautiful is being able to see things in all of us, in people, when we learn something and we internalize it and we utilize that to really become better people, kinder people, more empathetic people, people with boundaries, people with all the different things that we need to do that we're in this growing process having left Egypt and going towards Shavuot and the beautiful time of day and year and everything. And I always say this is a beautiful week and a beautiful day, but that's what we actually really make it. And I'm scanning because I put all my books on the side so I have uh, more space. But Robertson Heller, certainly Robertson Gottlieb, okay? Um, probably will just now start saying Robertson Sipora, um, has, been and has been really one of my teachers for the past 40 years. I can't believe that I can say 40 years when I'm only 25, that's what happens. And um, really what we need to be doing is taking and learning, and these are our role models who bring Torah to us and help us within this beautiful um, emotional space. Robertson's last latest book um, called A, A Distant Mirror. So there are actually even two of these, and I, I don't have the other one to show you that I don't have it right here with me, but she's brought in um, just pictures of Victoria Shasha, she should just be well and healthy and put it into that book um, as a visual because everything that we actually see when we have visual, it actually enhances things for us. So just before we go on, and I just wanted to say that um, as much as um, we wanted to have Rebetz and Hela here with us on Zoom in person, she recorded for us a message um, last week but please write down any messages. She's happy to answer and we will be having one of the follow-up sessions um, will be with Robertson um, Gottlieb. So just before we um, introduce you and give you her recording, um, so make yourselves comfortable, we're going to introduce to you um, Robertson Sipora Gottlieb. Are we there, parents? Rabbi David Gottlieb. David Gottlieb.
Chodit Sega, Gasha Tsipora, I believe in Unsha Kedash. Hey, Atma Kedash is doing the Torah. Zoom, Kedash, Moshe, and the Sukkot. Can you close your finger? Yes. Malo! Malo! That was nice to be able to go to a wedding for a few minutes and be in Yerushalayim. I have to tell you, my heart is really, oh, this is just amazing. And um, yeah, we are just blessed to have such a beautiful um, couple. And so with having introduced Rebetzin Tsipora Gottlieb, um, we will now relax and take in the awesome, amazing teachings. I want to just take this um, opportunity to welcome Rebetzin Tsipora Hela. Um, first, we'd like to just say a big, big mazel tov, and we'd like to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be able to um, come and give us a little bit of um, insight into Torah well-being and looking after ourselves. My pleasure. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about emotional well-being. So the foundation of understanding emotional being from the Torah's perspective could be gained if you could remember one Hebrew word. That word is melech. The word melech means king. What does this have to do with emotional well-being? The word melech is also an acronym for three parts of the body that correspond to different ways of being. So the Hebrew letter mem in melech, which is like m, stands for the Hebrew word moach, your mind. The Hebrew letter lamed, u, <coughs> stands for the word lev, okay, which means your heart. <coughs> Sorry. The Hebrew letter chaf, okay, <laughs> stands for the word klayot, which means your kidneys. What does this have to do with emotional well-being? We take in reality through our senses. But here's where this gets tricky. Your mind interprets reality instantaneously. Everything is in the interpretation. So your senses tell you what's out there. Is there a person? How do they look? What's their body language? What are they saying? But your mind interprets it. Your mind's interpretation, moach, goes down to your heart. Your emotions are the captain of the ship. Ultimately, you're going to go wherever your emotions take you. Okay. Your emotions and your mental state go down to the clio, to the kidneys. What's that? Okay. If you were a kidney, how would you spend your day? You would be filtering. So our day-to-day -day reality, in terms of emotional health, is what we reject and what do we integrate? Like the kidneys, which reject everything that's extraneous, that's toxic, and takes in everything that's nurturing and brings life. So the acronym Moach Lev Kaved is crucial. In what sense? As soon as you acknowledge everything is in the interpretation, then you're going to have consciousness Consciousness is what changes your emotional state. So I'm going to take you to a long detour and then come back. This detour con concerns David HaMelech, King David. King David was a, had a spark, the Talmud tells us, of Adam, the first man. Meaning he had something of the universality of Adam. Adam is obviously the biological source and the psychological source of all people's future. So even in the secular world, will they trace people all back to a common ancestor, they'll call it Jane, we're calling that person Adam, the source of everyone else, every subsequent person. 
We're told that David had a soul like Adam's. There was a certain kind of universality. If you read the book of Psalms to Hillam, you'll see he went through almost any possible human experience, love and hatred, loyalty and disloyalty, rejection and acceptance, health and illness, success and failure. It was universal. Okay, so he had various women in his life at different times, but the one I'm concerned with now is Bathsheba. Okay, she was, the lo she was the one who he realized was the one with whom he could build, the one who he had the most in common with. They married, but there was a sort of storm cloud over how their relationship began. She was the wife of a man called Uriah. They were legally divorced because he was in the army, and in those days all soldiers gave their wives conditional, conditional divorces. She and, Dov and David were together, and they had a child. The child was born critically ill. Okay, step back. This is where the story begins in terms of your understanding your own emotional health. So, because we're not face to face, so I can't hear your answers, I'm going to tell you the answers I assume. If you had a child who's born with a syndrome or an illness that the doctors told you was a death sentence, where would you be at? In your mind, and where would you be in your heart? So again, everything depends on the interpretation. Your mind may be telling you, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. His, his situation is not going to improve. I have to either flee and go into denial, or be there and suffer. And those are my possibilities. And there are some people who will flee, they'll be escapist. Everything's going to be just fine, okay? There's some people who are really there. And there's a third option. The third option is, I didn't create this child. This child, like every other human being in the world, is God's creation. I'll pray, I'll plead. So for David, this act, given that there was a cloud over the child's birth, was humiliating. He felt, and arguably rightly, that his actions affected his child. He repented. He began a, a series of fasts. He wouldn't sleep in a bed. He would lie on the floor. He wouldn't see people. He was continually praying for the child, trying to change things. And divine decrees do change sometimes. The child died. His servants didn't know how they could tell him. They were really worried about his life. They were saying one to the other, if this is how he was when the child was sick, barely functioning in absolute depression, in constant prayer and fasting, what's going to happen when we tell him the child died? So he saw the servants whispering, and he said, did the child die? And they said, yes. And what did he do? He got up showered, changed his clothes, went to the holy temple to pray, came home and ate a decent meal. What happened? People said, when the child was ill, you were distraught. The child died and now you're back to yourself? And he said, yes. I wanted to go to the holy temple to, to do what I believed in all along. You have to bless God for the bad, just like you bless him for the good. I have never suffered something so difficult. I came to bless God for this because I know there's a reason. Said, so why were you fasting? Why were you praying? It's because things could have changed. Then. But at this point, nothing is going to change. And the way things are is for the good. So in terms of emotional well-being, let's look at the stages in David's response. So first, again, his senses tell him what's happening. The child is not like other children. The child is not in response. The child is clearly gravely ill. His mind interprets this. The child was born to me, and the one woman I know is the one who is destined for me from the, from the creation, is gravely ill. What can I do? Where are my feelings? Okay, this is what's happening. How did he interpret it? By asking himself, what does God want of me now? So it's not just how do I feel, frightened, 
was clear that was clearly there. Um, responsible was clearly there. Grieved was clearly there. But he moved it into an how should I respond? So his response was to draw closer to God by any possible means. And in fact, those of you who are in a position to do so, I recommend that you read Tehillim, Nun Aleph, the book of Psalms 51, where he actually wrote about his process. He wrote about it. He blamed himself. He said, this is God's answer to me and my impulsivity, my pursuit of desire. Okay. But I changed. I did tshuva. Okay. And then it goes down to what? Down to the kidneys. Okay. I accept this is God's will. I've done what I can. And now what should I do next? And his answer was, now I should affirm that if this is from God, I accept it with love. So again, observation, interpretation, feeling, and choice. I'm going to repeat this one more time because this is the theme of our entire talk today. Observation, interpretation, feeling, and choice. So let's look over what parts of this do we have any dominion? Could you choose what you observe? Not really. Not really. So I'm going to give you an, an example of this. Some of you have heard of the former Ashkenazi chief rabbi, Rav Lau, a wonderful person. So when he was four years old, four years old, one of his earliest memories of his one seeing his father shot, which he wiped out, he can't bring back the scene. The scene that he remembers, even though he was there, is his mother realized soon thereafter that their town, Piotrkov, was doomed. And when the Nazis began making people divide into groups, the women, the children, the old people in group A, and the young men, and strong people in Group B, she understood what was happening. The train came into the train station. The women, children, old people were put in one group. The men, the strong people, were in another group. She handed him over to his brother, he was four, he was 13. And his early memories, he remembers kicking and biting and screaming, doing everything to get his brother to release him. And his brother having the strength to hold on to this kicking, biting, screaming child and getting on the train. Okay, now that's what he saw. Realize this, that's not negotiable. He can't press a button and see Sesame Street instead. That's what he saw. What are the choices of interpretation? His interpretation, you'll see it in his autobiography is he remembers his anger, but he remembers primarily his brother's strength. He remembers his brother's strength. He remembers how the brother put his feet on his own shoulders and maneuvered himself so he would get to the place in the train where the two walls met, so there was a bit of air coming in, so this four-year-old could breathe. His interpretation could have been very different. It could have been victimization. Why didn't I have a childhood? It could have been blame. How did we Jews end up in this situation? It could have been anger at the Nazis. He chose instead to interpret this in terms of his brother's heroism. This is a choice. Once that choice is made, it'll affect feelings. What feelings did this evoke in him? There's anger there with the Nazis. There's love of his mother, real love, for having the presence of mind to take this child who's clinging to her and passing him over to the brother. His love for his mother is there. His love for his brother is there. The primary emotion that he felt was love. When you trace his life, and you can through his autobiography, this is the primary emotion through which he makes his choices. He loves people. He wants them to feel beloved. He wants people to believe in themselves. He sees life as sacred. So notice, 
the mind affected the heart, which affected the choices. So this is what it's meant to look like. I'm going to give you one more example, and then I'm going to talk to you about what happens when the process is distorted, which, which could happen. Okay, another example of mind, heart, choices. Let's look at a very well-known story from the Bible, which is coming up. Soon it's going to be Shavuot. The heroine, the one whose Megill is read, is Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite princess. This is how her life began. Luxury, power, okay. That's what her senses tell her. She married a Jewish man who clearly wasn't on the path of Torah, otherwise he wouldn't have married a Moabite princess. He dies, leaving her destitute. That's what her mind sees. What was its interpretation? So let's look at her interpretation possibilities. Okay. Why did I marry him? I made one mistake. I better go back to the palace. I better clean my feet of these tracks. So that would be what? Regret. That's one interpretation. You made a mistake. Regret. Change. Okay? Another possibility. Um, despair. Self-hatred. When you talk to people who are in serious despair, I'm going to give, I'm going to sidetrack and give you just one short example. In Israel, they made very, very draconian decrees in order to prevent the spread of the, the coronavirus. One of them was a national shutdown of all of the stores. So there was a man who was on TV and he was crying. He has a falafel stand. He's saying, I never, never, I never returned a check. I never went into debt. I always supported my family, and now I have to close my store. He was crying. Okay, Netanyahu called him on the phone and said, I heard you. And he tried to put some laws to compens give some compensation to small business owners. But what was that man saying? He was saying, I'm in despair. There was somebody even, one of the merchants in the Machana Yudashuk, who, lo aleinu, may this not happen to us, committed suicide. But I want to tell you something. If the mind was talking to the heart, instead of the heart talking so loudly that it overrode the mind, because Corona is not going to last forever. This man's falafel store is going to be open tomorrow, literally tomorrow. They're opening the stores tomorrow. Not even a month from when he was at this pitch black bottom of despair. Your mind has to interpret and it has to inform the heart. So when it, when it works that way, then your life is balanced. Did I say good things will happen to you? I did not. But your ability to respond emotionally is balanced. If your heart, which is again the captain of the ship, doesn't listen to the navigator, the heart goes on its own. I can't judge the man who committed suicide. I didn't stand in his shoes. But clearly his feeling of despair, anger, betrayal, overrode his mind, which would have informed him, this is not forever. This is not everything there is in life. There's more to life than this. Your mind has to be in a position to interpret. You have to be critical enough to question your interpretations and then bring your heart into the picture. One of my memories is when I was about, um, how old could I have been then? Maybe 15. I was a junior counselor in a camp. It was um, a day camp, not a sleepover camp. And um, the, the head counselor was a young woman of maybe 20. Very bright, very insightful. And we would sit together on the bus that took us to pick up the children every day and to return them every evening. So we got to be close friends. One day she came in, she was clearly terribly shaken. She was a teacher. So I said, what happened? And she said, a child committed suicide. So I said, what? She said, an eight-year-old jumped off the roof of the school. Now remember my immaturity, I was 15. I said, why? You know what she said, I'll never forget her answer. It doesn't matter. He was eight, it was a mistake. An eight-year-old doesn't have the tools to have his mind inform his heart. 
An eight-year-old doesn't, doesn't know how to do this. You who are listening to this know how to do this. You have to have your mind interpret and speak to your heart. Your heart's the captain. Your heart is important. People hear this sometimes say, oh, she's saying be cerebral. Have No, I'm not saying that at all. You could be passionate. But your love should be directed. Your hatred should be directed by reality. Now, for you to see reality as it is, your mind has to take in the information and interpret it, question the interpretation, and send it to your heart. Okay, so why would, why would anybody bypass their mind? Why does this happen? So there are several reasons. I'm going to present you with a few of them. One is that we have learned responses. And in fact, they've discovered that if you repeat the same thing many times, you actually develop new neural pathways in your brain. And if you've seen pictures of the brain or actually I've seen a brain, a brain looks like macaroni, gray macaroni, all compacted and put together like this. That's what it looks like. So they're all, it's like, like macaroni. It's not like one smooth thing. It's all mushy. It's all, um, it's all divided up. New pathways are made through persistent repetition. So if a person, for instance, for whatever reason, I'm not going to go into reasons, I'm going to talk to you about factual reality. If a person learned as a young person, the best way to get to what you want is to scream. So something isn't going your way, what do you do? Scream. Does it work a lot of the time? Yes, and that's why you'll do it again and again and again, because sometimes it works. So now it's a little thing, oh, something's wrong, scream. So something happens. Let's say the bus slams its, its doors on your face, and there's still plenty of room on the inside, and you can't get on, and it's the last bus, and what are you going to do? <gasps> okay. Now, if your pathway say scream, you're going to be, open that door. Okay, clear? That's what's going to happen. So a lot of the reasons that people bypass thinking is because they've already established patterns of behavior. Who knows when? Who knows why? And they don't question them. So another person might realize, this bus is gone. Taxi, call up the bus company make new plans, they may move right into solution. Why? Because they may have patterned themselves into going into solution. So this movement from experiencing emotion and then if you have to go back and question, what am I really feeling and why? What am I really feeling and why? This doesn't always mean you'll be able to conquer your emotional reality and go back to your mind. Sometimes you will and sometimes you won't. But this is step one. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example of this. My dear, dear cousin, when he was young, uh, was on a program in Israel and the young men in the program had the opportunity to study in yeshiva. So they all wanted to be in the Rosh Yeshiva's shir. The Rosh Hashiva, they, they had some background. The Rosh Hashiva gave them an assignment to prepare Tosfot, a difficult commentary in the Talmud. Each one had like something to do. And um, they were all tested. So when he got into the Rosh Hashiva's room, the Rosh Hashiva destroyed his prepared Tosfot in a second. You didn't get the question right. You didn't get the answer right. He, he totaled it. Okay. His response, so this is a learned response, was, so what's the real answer? He went straight to solution. What's the real answer? He was accepted, not because he knew better than the other boys, but because he cared about the truth, more than making it a defensive emotional response, which a lot of people would have done. So this, is, this could be learned. It's a learned thing. You can create new responses. So if you find that you have an issue with yourself in going through your senses, your mind, your heart, you could learn to do it differently by introducing new thoughts. What thoughts? What are the thoughts that you have to introduce? If your conventional thought is, ah, what, what 
thought can you introduce? So I'm going to give you a couple of suggested thoughts. One is, I am not in control, God's in control. Here's the Chafetz Chaim example. So you're walking in the street, and you see someone who's a stranger in your village, and you say, hi, you're a stranger, what's your name? And he gives you a false name. He says, I'm Mickey Mouse, and clearly that's not his name. How much anger are you going to have? None, because what does this have to do with you? He's the idiot. You're not the okay. So he says, if you realize that what you experience is not in your hands, somebody does something wrong. So he did it. In the end, God determines what will happen to you. Last year, Rosh Hashanah was determined how much money you should have. So if you lost money because someone gave you a bad stock tip, so his name isn't Mickey Mouse. So what? Okay. Your emotional reality was determined. Your, your longevity was determined. So one thought is who's in control anyway? The corona epidemic, if nothing else, has taught us we're not in control. Is there anybody who's listening to this who a year ago said, wow, there might be this viral epidemic. It might shut down the whole Western world. Wow, okay. No. It's unimaginable. So the first thing that you say is, I'm not in control. I don't have to pretend I'm in control. Next thing that you say, and this has to go through together, is God only wants human benefit. Somehow this is exactly as it should be. All I have to figure out now is how to respond. So one reframe thought is, I'm not in control, and I'm glad God's in control. I'm not in control, and I'm glad he's in control. That makes it easier to move into response. Okay, what response? Solution. And there's a place for feeling. You could say, this is painful, but it might be what I need. This is unbearable, but it's what I need. This is uninterpretable, but who am I to interpret? So go back to the story I told you about David HaMelech, King David. When the child died, he didn't say, I understand why. It wasn't a cerebral decision to go to the temple and pray. It was, I trust God, and I want to sincerely say, no matter how I feel about this, I know it's to the, I know it's to the good. If you could integrate that way of thinking, you will retain emotional balance. It's like, it's a given. Having said this, remember I said there were three things. Not everybody is the same to begin with. So it's not only interpretation, it's ability to interpret. Some people are clearly more emotional than others. Some people have emotional disbalance that's chemically based. Okay. Some people have learned to make emotional responses and don't find it easy to unlearn it. So let's say it's very hard. So the example I gave you will work well if you're already pretty much a balanced person, but what if you're not? What if you have a chemical imbalance? What if you come from a very difficult background where you learn terrible responses? Then what? So again, what's our reframe thought? I'm not in control. I didn't choose my background. I didn't choose my chemical disbalance. I have to do the best with what I have. To do the best with what I have. And everything I do, every choice I make, is enormously valuable. So if you could learn to feel that, and you have emotional difficulties, your self-hatred will diminish. And once that happens, your ability to maintain some level of emotional control is going to be enhanced. So I'm going to give you um, two examples of that. Both of them involve people who I actually knew. Okay, one is a woman who suffered from what was then called bipolar disbalance. Okay, when she was young, I, I, her first episode was when she was 16. I didn't know her when she was 16. I knew her when she was around 20. Her first episode was dramatic, but she recovered from it. She came to Israel. I knew her when she was 20. She married shortly thereafter after she had other episodes. The way the medications worked then 
is that they were like magic. You stay on the medications they've been given for two weeks, you're back. But not 100%, 80%. It was magic. No more craziness, no more suicidal depression, but clarity of thought, moderation of response, wasn't 100%. And as a person stayed on the medications that they had then, now things are different. Longer, the body became progressively more resistant to the medication. And from coming back 80%, we'd end up coming back 75%, 72%, until you're clearly a person who's never really 100%. Yeah. So, um, how did she respond to it? How does she respond to it? She accepts it. She talks about it, which is very unusual. And she does her best. And uh, she'll talk about it. Oh, when I was, she's, she's South African. When I was disbalanced, I had actually went on this shopping spree. And, okay, she could talk about it. And uh, she has a wonderful relationship with her family. Okay, because it's clear that she accepts her disability and she does the best she can. Okay, another person who I know, okay, who, um, who also, who came from a very difficult and painful background, who's not inherently mentally disbalanced, there's no chemicals involved here, there are memories and patterns. So this person was able to, and it was a, a huge process, to get out of the knee-jerk responses that were learned over her extremely rejective, traumatic childhood. And at this point, you would never know that this is what she's been through. But it didn't take five minutes, it didn't take 10 minutes. What was the key? The key was learning to notice that her mind could speak to her feelings. Her initial state was she was denying her feelings. Everything was just fine, except it wasn't. So if they'd be rage, there'd be self-destruction. Okay. When she learned that her mind has to speak to her feelings, everything changed. So there's what to do. But so again, I want to frame what we've had. For a person who's basically healthy, mind, heart, kidneys. For a person who's not healthy, there has to be forgiveness of self, a commitment to do the best in one circumstance and an effort to bring the mind back into the picture to the degree to which it's possible. This requires professional help sometimes, this requires medication sometimes, this requires sometimes group therapy, but it always requires a hundred times out of a hundred, bringing your mind back into the picture and bringing Hashem back into the picture. Okay, so little examples of this. So I don't know how it is in England, but I know here in Israel, because the children were not going to school, the schools are all closed, the teachers have to do teaching on Zoom, and the kids are supposed to listen obediently to the, <laughs> to the online teacher, like little angels sitting like this, okay? So um, where's the mind, heart? Okay, be the mother, you're so frustrated. The kids, okay, the kids are climbing the wall. You want them to listen to the teacher. They're going, <laughs> okay, running away from the screen, tearing it. Okay, could this happen in real life? Yes. So your senses are telling you what? What are your senses telling you? The child is running away. The teacher is still talking. That's all your senses told you. The rest is interpretation. Everything is in the interpretation. Everything. You interpret it. This system is difficult to manage with my children. They are children. Children find this difficult. I'll have to do what I can to make it easier. Bribery is good, okay? <laughs> Bribery is always good, okay? Getting the children involved in it themselves is good. You move to solution. But if you don't, and you just see the children disobeying, what is your heart going to tell you? I'm not in control. I have to maintain control. This has to happen. Get that! Okay, whatever. 
But if you bring your mind into it, it's a question of how can I maintain control? And this is from who? Who determined this? Who wrote the script? It's from Hashem. It's ultimately good. Perhaps this can change my relationship to my children. Perhaps this could be a positive experience. What should I do? What's my, where are my kidneys here? What should I say yes to? What should I be saying no to? So I'll give you a positive example. Okay, um, one of my daughters has children of many different ages, which does not make it easier. A 16-year-old is at home. 16-year-old boys at home is like never a good situation. They don't have, they don't like to be confined. Okay, um, a 14-year-old, a five-year-old, and trying to think how's the, how old is the other one? I'm not sure of the other age. Eight, nine, no, 11. Okay, so she made a, she made a contest in which the big boy who knows how to lane will read one pasuk. The boy underneath him explains it. The other kids get to sing and get a reward. Are they going to end up huge Talmidei Chachamim? But are they doing something positive and bonding? Yes. They finished the whole book of Zechariah, one of the minor prophets, and they enjoyed it. And that takes them, you know, there's the preparation, and then there's the doing, and there's the reward. This eats up time, and it gives them a positive feeling about themselves. But you would have to come with the mentality to even dream this up. This is from Hashem. It must be for the good. What could I do about it? And then feel your kids' needs. Understand them. Be focused on them, not just on your desire to control the situation, which is doomed. Okay, so that is the key. Okay, did, okay, everybody, did everybody stop? stop the time? Okay, okay, so I don't know if we, I think it was me or if we just missed the last words, but um, I, I could sit with Herbert and Hela for, for, for just, just all day. And as somebody sent in a message and said, so wise. And the truth is, yes, we're all blessed to have such wise women that learn all their beautiful wisdom, they will tell you, from the Torah, and it's putting it into action. And, um, and we're just blessed to have these people who share with us um, and and even uh, maybe maybe it's easier being like this that we had Rebus and Anna recorded because I didn't feel I felt that she was there talking to me especially after being at her wedding went straight from the wedding to to a wonderful bit of, of inspiration once again do a little bit of you know, your 15 seconds, your minute, your two minutes, whatever, get yourself a cup of tea, get ready. For those of you that are going to be joining um, the yoga class with Sarah or with Galore, believe me, uh, you'll feel it maybe not right now, but maybe a little bit later. But the idea really is, is that you get involved in this next class. As I said, um, when I spoke to Galore last night, as you said, it's not just for watching, okay, girls, this is for doing so. Just take a little bit of a walk around, stretch yourself, and we'll come back in a minute or two. Um, and just for London, um, as things happen in um, London, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say we might be. I'm just waiting for timing on deliveries. I don't know where they are around in Manchester, but the deliveries have left a little bit late. Um, just seeing if there's an update. Not yet. Um, but just make sure that you've got an apple or uh, we should do, instead of doing smoothies later, we should have done them now to keep us going a little bit, maybe a small yogurt or something, um, but it will be there with you soon. I will let you know as we update it. So go and stretch yourselves, just take in, um, this is my third time I've listened to this, so it just gets better every time you listen. So we will have the recording for later because we just miss things along the way. Okay, so just enjoy your couple of minutes. And again, I keep seeing you all and I just want to come and say hi and give everyone a big hug. And um, and it really is so lovely. Hi, Nakamala. Hi, everybody. And Manchester, London, it, it is incredible, really, what we can do while we're here. Enjoy your few minutes. Ma, um, Galore, you're looking like you're ready. Ochte da the Sedel. And also, um, I can't see where Sarah is. Ah, oh, and where's Sarah here? 
think I can't see if she's online. We'll find her in a minute. Relax two minutes and we'll see you back soon.